This show is sponsored by Sims Business Systems, Arizona's number one family-owned technology boutique, serving your copy, print, IT, and teleconferencing needs since 1978. Smartify your business with Sims. Welcome to Exposing Entrepreneur Secrets. I'm your host, Sean Sims Bradford. This is the show where we learn the secrets to business owners' successes, and we get to know the heart, mind, soul, and the vision of the business owner. I am so excited to have Rab Paquette in studio with us today. Rab is fascinating. He is a serial entrepreneur. He has started more than 20 businesses, and he will leave you today with his secret to startup success. And he has run businesses from national banks to small startups. And he currently runs Vita Property Services with his wife, Liz. And a really amazing fact about Rab is that he works with Silent Witness, and we'll get into that as well. Rab, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Sean. It's really a pleasure to be speaking with you about entrepreneurship. The pleasure is all mine, and I want to know, as do our listeners, what is your motivation to start businesses, not just one? You've started 20. It's really kind of odd, and I've been doing some soul-searching regarding entrepreneurship and what drives me lately, and I finally boiled it down to the fact that I've never really been money-motivated. I've made great money and lost great money in my career. I'm very much more motivated motivated by serving my customers and mm-hmm. taking care of people. So in almost all of my businesses, I always try – I don't even try. I always put the customer first and take care of the customer, and profits and money typically follow afterwards. That is such beautiful advice, and I can imagine it's not easy advice when you're in that startup struggle where money may be short and you need extra money. It probably can get challenging to put the client first. What do you do to always remind yourself this is just how it has to be? How have you instilled that? Sometimes I decide in my mind that if I have to give to a client more than I'm going to receive back monetarily, that I consider it marketing. And then long term, it will come back to me over um, over a long period of time. I'll, I'll get my rewards. Mm-hmm. And so I try to oh, you know take care of the client first, worry about money later, and figure that I want this client for life. I don't want them for a couple of months or a couple of weeks. And if I have them as a lifetime client, then I will definitely receive my rewards as time goes on. That is awesome advice that any business owner, anybody working with clients should really take to heart. Now, Rab, tell me, with 20 businesses, have they all been successful right from the start? Have you had any challenges getting them going? We've had, of course, not all of them have been successful from the start, and a lot of them were really hard grinds to get going, Mm -hmm. and I've had some colossal failures in my life also. The biggest business that I was ever involved with or ever formed or was on the board of was a bank, and we were taken over by the feds in the collapse in 2008, and I lost a giant investment there. But now that it's all said and done and the blood is out of the street, I feel like I learned more from that experience than from probably any other business I was in. That is so much blessing in that learning growth and that experience. What did you learn, if you don't mind sharing it with us? Well, one of the biggest things I learned is having the federal government as a partner in a business is extremely difficult. (laughs) And I wouldn't recommend it to anybody unless they move very slowly and cautiously. The other thing that is a great life lesson is sometimes life moves and you have no control over it. As in the great real estate recession of 2007, 2008, we had no control over the market collapsing. No one foresaw it. And when the market did collapse, collapse, we were right in the way. And so we had no chance of reacting fast enough to the market collapse. And so through no fault of our own, really, we lost this great investment in this great business. 
So sometimes the market moves and you have no way of reacting fast enough. And so how have you taken that challenge from that experience with the bank and working with the federal government into what you're doing now? Well, one of the things that um, I like about what we're doing now with my property management business Mm -hmm. is my partner and I, my partner's Bernadette Smith, we are in a business uh, that caters to wealthy individuals who have second vacation homes in higher end communities around the country, around the state. And we're scaling the business to go into several other communities. And because of the nature of the financial aspects of our customers, it tends to be recession proof. As long as we perform, we feel like during a deep recession, we would not really be impacted too harshly. So shifting business a little bit is it helps a lot. That is incredible that you really have figured out a secret to be recession proof. What is some advice you can give to listeners to really do the same thing, to make a business stand the test of time over all the hurdles and all the bumps? Well, as most people know, debt is a two-edged blade for you. And debt you need debt to grow, but also debt hurts you when things turn down. So it's always important to really not inquire too much debt or too much credit responsibility with your company. So that because when things turn down, boy, the banks and your lenders want to be paid no matter what your financial situation is. So we're very careful of how much debt we have and how much debt we acquire. And we try to stay very much on top of paying our bills and paying our debt back as fast as we can. Also, the less debt we have and the more ability to attain capital allows us to grow faster when we want to. So we may want to acquire a company, say, like in Telluride, Colorado. If we have less debt right now, we have the ability to borrow more money to acquire a company. So it allows you to be a lot more flexible in what you want to do. That is exceptional advice. And also to a, let's say somebody right now wants to not buy a startup, but completely create a new business from scratch. What would you tell them for the first either year, two years, three years? How long does it normally take you to get the business going and making a profit? I've been always probably too much focused on sales in my life and not focused enough on profits. However, Sales tell the tale of whether you you can be successful or not. If you don't have sales, you don't have anything. Mm. And so if you have sales, you can always work your profits into those sales down the road. So I'm focused on sales. If you don't sell $100 worth of goods today, you have no chance of having any profit at all. So it's better to sell $100 worth of goods and, and make a small profit and have a large volume, kind of like the Amazon model where they make very, very little profit on huge sales. It's better to have the sales and the customer ball rolling downhill than to have uh, low sales and high profits. Oh, that makes so much sense to anybody starting because, you know, you want to make sure you're doing everything just right when you're starting a new business, but you have to be out there getting clients because if you don't have the sales, you don't have anybody interested in your product, you don't have anything to grow. Exactly. Most people analyze their business too much. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most important things that uh, people can really remember is the standard business mantra is get ready, then aim your business where it needs to go, and then pull the trigger and fire and start it. And I've found that um, by operating that way, by the time you pull the trigger, you have 10 other competitors have already had your idea, and they're already established and operating. So I've always tended to jump off the cliff mm. before I've done a lot of research. And so my mantra is ready, fire, and then aim. Get the thing going, get it operating, jump off the cliff, and figure out what's going to happen on the way down to the ground before you hit the ground. And it's worked for you. I mean, 20 businesses. It has. It's worked for you. That is that is amazing because you're just saying, get this good idea off of the ground and then figure it out. That's, that's my plan. You have to have clients. You have to have clients or a revenue source that you know is going to be there, you know, before you want to open your doors, typically. You have to know that you have some kind of volume coming in or you have to have an amazing amount of capital behind you that you're willing to risk. It takes risk, and the, the old risk 
risk-reward maxim is exactly true. The more risk you take, typically, the more reward potential there is. That makes sense. And you, Rab, have so much just pure grit and grind to really love and enjoy all of the startup. I mean, you do it over and over. Where does that grit come from? I don't know where it comes from. I know as a child that I grew up, you know, fairly lower income in West Phoenix, and we didn't have a whole lot of money, and I started cutting grass in my neighborhood, and I had a great little landscaping business going by the time I was about 13, 14 years old and had some great success and really forged two or three fantastic client relationships at a young age, and I realized that I have this client now, and I'm going to have them next year and next month as long as I continue to perform, and I make a little bit of money every week off of them, and it just kept rolling in. And I bought a boat before I bought a car when I was 15 years old. Before I could even drive, I owned a boat because I always wanted a boat. I don't know why, but so I like the grind, and I, I like the struggle of startups and making it happen, and I have sought partners that handle the other side of the business for me more, more of the day-to-day management and organization, while I focus on more of the marketing and the client relationships. That is highly intelligent to not do it all yourself, but to pair with people that balance you out really nicely. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's super smart. I, in a moment, want to start talking about Silent Witness, but I do want to ask your current property management company, what, tell me the name of that again. It's called Vita. Vita. Which is a Latin word for life. Oh, I love that. Vita. What has been your biggest success there to date? Well, I have to pat myself on the back. My biggest, my biggest success was finding an incredible partner to partner with me mm-hmm. that has exactly the opposite skills that I do and some of the skills I do, but she is very skilled in being organized and scheduling and running the business side of the business. And so we immediately started picking up new clients when we opened our doors and the business has taken off. So we are fortunate to have each other as partners. It's kind of like a marriage. And you know what I love about that is a lot of people would say, I'm going to do it all myself. It's my idea. I want to do it myself. But you have the wisdom to get out of your own way to say, these are the things that I don't excel at. I'm going to work with somebody else that excels at them, and I'm going to go do what I excel at so it's more enjoyable. And, And, Sean, you hit upon something so important right there. Being humble enough to realize and understand what you're not good at and seeking help in those areas is probably one of the biggest secrets to success in business. Seeking help, if you're not a great person at accounting organization, finding help in doing it is very, very important to you. Whatever your weak points are, realize those and seek help in those areas. Now, let's say we have somebody listening that is just starting their business. They're four months in and they're like, okay, I recognize my weaknesses. My weakness is sales. I'm great at the the logistics, the accounting, but I can't afford to hire somebody or partner some with somebody, what would you say to them? That's a very difficult situation because the sales and marketing side of the business is primary because without that, you have nothing. If you don't have sales, you don't have anything. So I would tell them that they would probably have to really stretch and possibly give up a piece of their business, give up some equity to bring in a good salesperson. Do we gonna do it on a trial basis to make sure they, they work out, make sure they have integrity? And then give them a piece of your business in order in order to bring them in and have them be a marketing person for you. That it costs you nothing to do, and then it gives, you're giving up equity, so there is a cost, but it's not costing you anything out of your pocket. And maybe you bring in a, a great home run hitter. That is an excellent piece of free advice that I can't imagine would not work. Thank you for that. <laughs> I want to move on to. Silent Witness. You are involved with Silent Witness. How did that happen? Silent Witness is one of my passions in life. It's a volunteer board membership. It's a quasi-police, private, public organization. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Okay. 
We meet at the Phoenix Police Department. Mm -hmm. We are in conjunction with the Phoenix Police Department. They staff our, our staff, and we work with all of the police departments in really in the entire country, but primarily in Maricopa County. Okay. And Silent Witness is works behind the scenes on, I can tell you, most of the crimes you see in the paper that were solved in the newspaper or on any social media, we had a hand in it. Wow. Most people don't know about it. No. B- because Silent Witness works anonymously behind the scenes because tipsters, what we operate really is a tip line. We run video on national TV, on local TV, national TV, and we have billboards, like a lot of electronic billboards, and in social media. And somebody sees one of our videos and says, wow, that looks like Rab Paquette that robbed that bank. <laughs> and then they'll call into Silent Witness, and they, they remain 100% anonymous. Mm-hmm. They can c- contact us via the Internet or you know, texting, and we have methods of staying, keeping them anonymous. They receive a number. And they're identified by that number from then on. Sometimes they call us or we communicate with them two or three times. Once an arrest is made, they, they have a cash deposit or a cash envelope waiting for them at a local bank. And they just walk in and say, I'm silent witness number 562. And they get their cash reward and they're gone. And we, silent witness, brings 20 to 30 hardened, very vicious felons off the street every single month. That is, first off, thank you. (laughs) That is amazing. I had no idea this sounds straight out of a movie. And I didn't even know this whole platform existed. How did you, how long have you been involved with them? I've been on the board of directors for 10 years now. I was invited by uh, a fellow board member and my purpose is primarily fundraising because the police are very good at finding felons and making arrests, and we need to raise the money to pay for the rewards. And so we struggle and to, to raise enough money because, because of the anonymity factor of silent witness, it's hard for us to say, yes, we solved that crime. And so we have trouble telling our story. So there's this incredible story happening behind the scenes of what we do but we have trouble discussing it with the general public. I can imagine because I didn't know about it. Right. Now, how has your entrepreneur skills helped with what you're doing for Silent Witness? How has the fundraising aspect? It's really, really funny because we are not, the board is not involved in policing, obviously, at all. Right. The, the police department takes care of the police side. All we do is gather information and send it to the police department's and if there's a crime that happens in, let's say, Tucson, and we, get a, we receive a tip on it, we will c- communicate with the Tucson Police Department and let them, they handle it down there. So the tips are disseminated to whatever police department, you know, United States Marshals, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office is a huge partner of ours. Sheriff Paul Penzone's been a great supporter of Silent Witness, and we love him, and he's helped us a lot. My own personal experience with fundraising is through having events, and we raise money um, through uh, bringing local businesses in and having them participate, like golf tournaments, trivia nights. We even have a sporting place tournament out at Ben Avery Shooting Center that's getting really large. You shoot shotguns, and it's really fun, and you get to go out and shoot with police people on your team. And people like that a lot, and that's getting large. The other way that I have helped Silent Witness is by bringing in corporate sponsors that uh, write us checks. And so we're always looking for a sustainable income for our rewards. Thank you for sharing that with us. And actually, right now, tell us if somebody's thinking, I want to help support Silent Witness, how do they get a hold of you? Silentwitness.org. Silentwitness.org. Simple, simple, simple. It's very very simple. And it's an incredible organization. Very few people know about and the crimes and the people we take off the street are, are so impactful in our own neighborhoods that it's kept me very passionate for the program. I can hear it in your voice how passionate <laughs> you are. And I love that all the skills you've acquired through your business ventures has really helped to fuel this passion. I want to know, you've, you've got a lot going on. You have currently, you know, this awesome new property company. You're with Silent Witness. What do you do, Rab, to recharge, to relax, and to refresh? Well, 
I, it's, that's really important to me. When we started Vita Property Services November 1st, 2018, we were bludgeoned by the time requirement. We really misunderstood how much time and misjudged how much time it would take to get the business up and operating, not from managing the business, but because of all the customer requests we had immediately, we had to respond to them. So time-wise, we were, I, would, I like to use the word, we were slaughtered because it, it, it consumed us for the first 60, 90 days. Mm -hmm. Now things have started to settle out. And so I'm, I work out a lot. I like to travel a lot. We have a lot of trips planned. I, in July, I climb Mount Kilimanjaro. So I'm really looking forward to that. Wow. I'm and I'm training for that every single day. And when I leave here, I'm going to get a big hike in to prepare. So I believe in physical activity as a great stress reducer. I think it's important. Yeah. And can you just, can you feel it? Does it just progress into everything you do throughout the day? Completely. That's, that's amazing. Completely. I want to leave folks with, I mean, you've given us so much awesomeness already. What is one final tip that you want to leave with somebody that is just in the grind process of starting their business? I guess I would say there's always light at the end of the tunnel if you seek it and you look for it. There's always something great and wonderful down at the end of the tunnel. Even if you fail, the takeaway from your failure, if you look at it objectively, probably was worth the entire effort of what you did. So there's always some kind of good there to be had. There is always good in every situation. There is always light. That is something that's going to replay in my head over and over today. So thank you for that. Rab, if somebody wants to get a hold of you personally, uh, how would they do that? You could contact me at my uh, Vita Property Services email, which is rab, R-A-B, at vitapropertyservices.com. Rab at vitapropertyservices.com. Thank you, Rab, so much for coming on Exposing Entrepreneur Secrets. You gave us tons of amazing secrets that I know our listeners are finding super valuable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. My pleasure.